Welcome to another episode of our podcast series, The Color of Music. We are honored today to have a dis our distinguished baritone, Roderick Williams, join us. Roderick is one of the most sought after baritones of his generation, known for his versatility across opera, concert performances, and recitals. His illustrious career has taken him to some of the world's most prestigious opera houses and concert stages. And he has been involved in numerous world premieres, bringing new music to life. Not only is he a remarkable performer, but he's also an accomplished composer and a passionate advocate for music education and outreach. Uh, thank you for being here. That's my pleasure. And welcome, Roger. Can you can you share with us how your uh, journey into music began? Uh, and was there a particular moment or influence that led you to pursue a career as a baritone? That's a good question. That's, uh, Career in music, well, I suppose I was always around music at, the, at my family home in North London, Barnet, North London, just where um, uh, London turns into Hertfordshire and you get green fields. Um, and my parents, neither of them are professional musicians, uh, but they're great listeners. So they had uh, the, the classical radio on in our house a lot, and they got a wonderful record collection, which I still rifle through from time to time, um, which they brought, brought together when, when they got married. Um, and I suppose I'm the middle of three boys as well. My, my two brothers are also very musical, but they do other things. Uh, the eldest has a career as a mechanical engineer and my younger brother's a, a, math, a maths teacher. So they've got other things to bring to the party, and, but I'm, I've just got music. So. Um, so with classical music being around the house all the time, it was natural for us, the three brothers, my, my, my brothers and myself, to make music. It, uh, as a trio, and then with my dad as well, sometimes singing, sometimes playing on recorder, um, and then at school as well, in school choirs and orchestras and things like that. So it, for us, it's entirely normal. Um, uh, whatever your upbringing is, wherever you are in the world, you, I think you just see what you do as normal, and when people then ask you a question, how did you first get into music, it kind of seems a bit strange. Well. Didn't everybody get into music? Didn't everybody have the same upbringing as me? It's, it's, the crucial thing is my, my parents having classical music around, and other sorts of music too, but, but a lot of classical music around, so that we, we grew up with that sound. Uh, my older brother was a chorister at Christchurch Cathedral um, in Oxford, and I went to the same feeder school for that. I wasn't in, exactly in that choir, but I sang daily services. So that church choir upbringing as a little boy was really important too. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, as I was growing older, um, just taking part in music at school, that was the music department of the school I went to was a, it's a uh, independent school in the uh, uh, north edge of London, it's called Haberdashers in Elstree. Um, and had a separate music department, separate building from other buildings, and those sort of buildings can become refuges for people like me. It's where we go to hide from other things, uh, particularly the, um, the sports and science departments, I know, get, trying to get their claws into us. So I would hide in the music department, and that became, uh, as I got older, that became more and more my world. <clears throat> without my, without my uh, concentrating on it, I, I didn't, I didn't, sort of think music's going to be my thing, my career, my future. It was much, I was much more at that age focused on what was directly in front of me. I don't think I knew at that age that a music career was a thing. Careers advice in the, late, in the, in the 1980s was focused more on getting people to be doctors and, and barristers and, uh, and journalists and what, and what have you. There, on all the little forms we, we, we were looking at, or you know, brochures for careers, no one slides one in saying, have you thought about a career in opera? Have you thought about a career on the stage? They'd probably be um, escorted off the school grounds if they did that sort of thing. So look, uh, I, I meet a lot of people still who ask me, you know, uh, see that I'm singing on stage and ask me what I do as my day job, as my normal job, unaware that this can be a profession. Well, I was one of those people. I was unaware that it could be a profession. I had no idea about being a singer, being a professional musician as, at, at all. And it was only, I suspect, at university, uh, um, when I was a choral scholar with other singers around me, noticing that they did know about this profession. They, they did have an idea of going 
beyond university to start singing or, or in one or two cases um, being instrumentalists um, out in the big wide world. And I saw them do it as I went into a career in teaching and just seeing their examples, oh, oh you, you can make a living like that, can you? That's a, that's a thing. You're, you're permitted to have a go. And I was, I was probably nearer 30 um, when I retrained at the Guildhall School of Music in London with an eye to um, learning about operas. Opera is not something I'd ever done before. I've never really been on stage. I was always in the um, orchestral pit during school productions of things. Um, so I'd never tried acting or anything like that before. Um, it was only training at the Guildhall uh, uh, the, on the opera course, which is a course I picked slightly at random, two-year yeah. postgraduate course, which sounded like fun. You got to do um, combat training and, uh, and, and prosthetics and stuff like that, yeah. so it just sounded fun. And I, and I realized, actually, I quite enjoyed dressing up in, in other people's clothing and being other people and singing this, this fantastic repertoire that I knew nothing about as a choral singer. And in different languages. And in different languages, yeah. too. That was a shock. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd sung, as a boy, um, as, a, as a chorister, I'd sung in Latin and I'd sung in English. Pretty much it, you know. It maybe the odd bit of German. I wish I'd uh, paid a bit more attention in my modern language classes. Hmm. But suddenly to be thrust into a world where, where most operas seem to be in someone else's language, that was quite a steep learning curve. But it, it, it's, it was quite a gradual process, and, and it is one in which... When I look back in hindsight, I realized I had very little control over it. Um, I was quite happy. It's a bit like white water rafting. You know, I just, I was just quite happy to see where the turns take me. But um, there's no point standing at the bottom of, the, of a, a white water river and thinking, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take that turn. I'm going to do, answer that call or whatever. I'm going to engineer my career in such and such a way. No, I just ran with it. <laughs> Well, the next one you knew probably knew I was going to ask you. Uh huh. Yeah. Go on. Uh, yeah, it's around the coronation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. I'm shy about it now. <laughs> how'd you uh, How'd you feel being a feature soloist invited to sing in the coronation of King Charles III in May of '23 uh, before the king before King and Country and an estimated 400 million worldwide watching this historical TV event. And I looked up the numbers. So yeah, very good, accurate. very okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, can I deal with them? I'll deal with the numbers first. Okay. Uh, because uh, the great thing about that service was that the cameras had to be discreet. Um, unlike um, other occasions when you're, you're making music, particularly, I don't know, filming of concerts or whatever, where the camera's right in front of your nose. You, and, and a constant reminder, or, or even having microphones in front of you, it's a constant yeah. reminder that someone will be listening. Unlike that, in the Abbey, the cameras were hidden, very discreet, so I didn't really notice those. And in fact, it meant, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, it meant I was much able, much more able to look straight into the eyes of the person I'm singing to, who is Andrew Nethsinger, the um, choir master at Westminster Abbey. Yes. So much as I'm having a conversation with you now, uh, it's, it's a slightly further distance, but only, only a few further paces. When it was time for me to sing, I was able to look Andrew in the eye and sing directly to him, person to person. Uh, numbers like, what did you say? Four, 400 million. 400 million are meaningless. Yeah. If you'd said 40 million or 4 million or 4 yeah. billion or whatever, it, it, I have no concept yeah. of what that is. As far as I'm concerned, I'm singing for my parents watching at home. And my wife, who was, who was outside um, in, in, watching on television, and Andrew Nethsinger right in front of me. It makes it much easier to do, um, it's much easier for a human mind to, to, to huh. grab that concept. That's why you were smiling. Yes. I was quite pleased, because I, I, I watched <laughs> the whole ceremony. You were smiling yes, at that. Yes. <laughs> but also added to that, of the things, you know, I was quite rational about this because every time I had a, a, a frisson of nerves beforehand, I could say to myself, Roddy, the piece lasts 72 seconds that I was singing, the Convotare. It's a very short part of the service. So it's very brief. There's not too much to remember. And I can sing at all. It doesn't go high. It doesn't go low. So it's all music I can sing. And I've been training for it for about 40, 45 years. <laughs> so, so it's all under control. The only thing that that might go wrong is I might have a senior moment and just forget what the words were, you know, under that under the glare of the, the, the lights in the moment. So 
specifically, I started smiling when I'd got the second sentence out. Once I got the second sentence without my mind just going into a sort of automatic washing machine flat spin, you know. Once I got the second sentence, I thought, I think this is going to be okay. Yeah. And then you can see the smile on my face yeah. go, oh, well, I'm yeah. going to be all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that endeared me to you at, at, at that point. <laughs> and, I, and I'm an American. So. Uh, very good for you. Very yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Confratari? And uh, you also, I understand, was a, um, worked in uh, conjunction with a couple on the triptych for orchestra arrangement of the hymn, Thy, <coughs> Be Thou My Vision, which is beautiful. That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I just, I'll just have a little <coughs> sip here. Yeah. I can tell you about that. <coughs> um, the... Two bookings, if you look at it as bookings, because it is a, you know, it is a job, two bookings were entirely separate. Um, I was invited to write a piece of music for the concert that was the preamble to the service. Um, and separately to that, I was invited to sing in the service itself. And that was a wonderful. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an extremely lucky person to, to have had my name come up twice yeah. um, in these different circumstances. And... As you say, the, the Be Thou My Vision um, uh, composition was shared between um, Nigel Hess and Shirley Thompson and myself. We were contacted and asked for two minutes each to make a six-minute piece. Um, and we had a wonderful Zoom call, what would be in the beginning of, the, of 2023, in the early months of 2023, to decide kind of how to divide it up. And Nigel said, well, I'll begin the fanfare and I said, oh, well, I'd quite like to do the slow movement. And Shirley said, oh, well, I'd, I'd love to finish it off. Yeah. There we are, job done. No arm wrestling required, no rock, paper, scissors required. It was very, very easily um, sorted out. And the, I think that that Zoom call might have been on a Friday. By Sunday, Nigel had sh sent me the short score of his first movement. He just spent the weekend on it. It's two minutes of composition. It's not too long, and it's best to to go with the inspiration. So he'd sent it to me within 48 hours. I then had a, a, a week or so while I was traveling. I was actually in the States, um, and I was um, traveling between uh, New York and uh, Vermont, the Brattleboro and Vermont. Um, and the composition I wrote is actually, uh, I, I like to, to show where it was that I that I finished a piece, I'd write a little note on the on the double bar line at the end. So it says um, Interstate 95 because I was in the back of a car, just on my laptop, just getting the last bits yeah. done. I was able to send my my section off to Shirley um, within, uh, I suppose, now a week of that first Zoom call, and, uh, and away we went. Um, and just to come back very briefly to the Confortari, this part of the coronation service, I've sung in many services of my life, um, from Eucharists to uh, funeral requiems um, to e many, many even songs. So I'm very familiar with the format of those. Uh, as you can appreciate, I've never sung in a coronation before. Um, there hasn't been many of them around for a while. You know, there used to be. There used to be, um, you know, sort of every other year, it seems to be. There was a short period where we got through quite a few kings and, and queens. And, uh, but then the service hadn't been, the service ha format hadn't been used for a long time, so I'd never heard of the Confortare. But it's a specific moment just after the king has been crowned and after his loyal subjects all shout out, God save the king, and all this sort of stuff goes on. And... Uh, the choir then sings this text to him, be strong. And it's, it's, it feels like the people reminding the king of his duty, um, almost, reminding, almost demanding of him. You know, this is the small, let me sing you the small print. This is what we expect of you. So it's quite, um, it's quite a powerful moment. Uh, the setting I sang was by Henry Wolford Davis. And there is a recording on YouTube of, of the audio of King George V's um, coronation. I suspect that's when... That, that, that was the service that Wolford Davis wrote, that wrote this piece for. But I've never heard it before. I never heard of it. I've never heard it. Um, and it came to me uh, uh, to sing, and, uh, and I had a ball with it. Yeah. 72 seconds. Well, the world, the world enjoyed it too. You know? <laughs> and the other one, people would love me to ask you, is it, uh, did, you, did you personally get to meet Charles and uh, Camilla and any of the uh, social events afterwards? Yeah. Um, 
obviously they were busy on the day itself, so yeah, I didn't yeah, meet them yeah. then. And the day afterwards, they had a wonderful function at um, one of their little, their small pads, um, uh, Windsor Castle, uh, to say thank you to people who'd been involved in, 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 in all of this. And various members of the royal family were there. Now, it, it was a room as big as this uh, lovely um, recital hall we're in, concert hall we're in here, here in Nelson today. Um, and I did see them across a crowded room, but there was no chance of getting close up to them because there's so many people um, yeah. milling around and asking them uh, about various things. I did see him a month later, though. A month later to the day after he was crowned, there was a concert of Handel coronation anthems um, given in a church in the centre of London. And the, the king let it be known he was going to come to this concert, so they asked me to sing at this, con at this occasion. I was racking my brains as to what would be appropriate. And then finally came through, no, no, we don't want you to sing anything. We want you to sing something specific. We want you to sing the first verse of the national anthem <laughs> as the king enters. So I ended up, uh, quite literally, I was this far away from him, as far as we are together, and I sang, God save the king, <laughs> straight, yeah. straight into his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't Most smile on that one. Uh, I think I might have done. Yeah. Actually, he didn't smile. He he must have heard that piece for his mother a, a few times. Yes. Um, but he was he was he, he's a professional. He was remarkably composed all through it all. As I'm thinking, this is the oddest thing I've done for at least a month. Um, uh, and I yeah, it was odd. And as he sat there listening to the handle. And this French choir, coincidentally, the, 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 Le Concert Spirituel, they were singing, May the King Live Forever, Amen, Amen, Amen. And he's sitting there, he said, that, that's you. <laughs> may, he, may you live forever. It's quite odd, oh, anyway. Wow. Well, <clears throat> your repertoire spans from Baroque to contemporary music, and how do you approach such a wide range of styles? And do you have a particular area or composer you feel most connected with? <clears throat> That's a great question, and I, I like to think that the answer is that I approach everything in the same way. I, I try and make it as singable for my voice as I can, whether it's um, angular contemporary music or whether it's uh, Baroque recitative um, and anything in between. I try and sing it so it feels comfortable for me, first and foremost. It may well be that even unconsciously I'm, I'm managing different styles so that my um, my classical Mozart doesn't sound like Verdi, uh, so that it sounds stylistic. I'm probably making those sort of um, uh, uh, decisions all the time. Incidentally, I did once coach a young American singer, uh, Italian-American singer, who was singing um, an English song, Sleep by Ivor Gurney. And it's the first time in my life I've ever heard someone sing an English song as though it were Italian opera. <laughs> I, 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 it was most extraordinary. And when he got to the end, I was a bit flummoxed as to what to say to him because it, it sounded on one hand totally wrong, stylistically totally wrong. But on the other, I really wanted to explore why it is that, or, or, or why he couldn't sing with this glorious voice, but in this style it was, it was an odd moment. So that, that proved to me that I do actually approach all my different sorts of music from a different frame uh, uh, viewpoint, but that's more stylistic than it is, I think, from a vocal production point of view. And mm -hmm. what was the second part of your question? You asked about that and... Uh, was there a particular composer you ah. feel more connected to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a real tough one. Yeah. And, and I'm going to have to, to for, the, <laughs> for the sake of brevity, I'm going to have to answer the answer, no. Um, I love all sorts of different musics, and what I'm singing at the time, quite genuinely, is the thing that fires me up most. So um, uh, later on today, I'll be singing a concert of English song, and I have, if I've got a reputation for anything at all, it would be for singing English song. And this might lead people to think that I am championing English song out of some, um, I don't know, some altruistic uh, yeah. uh, 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 love of this particular thing, not least because I write English 
in English song, I suppose. Um, but it's not that. I love all sorts of music. I love singing German song. I love singing French song. I love singing Russian song. I love singing all sorts of different things. And I love singing things that aren't song. I love singing opera. I love singing concert repertoire. I love singing it all. I, I am so gushy with the um, privilege of being able to do this as a profession and whisper it quietly, people pay me to do it. Imagine, imagine that. The, the thing that I really enjoy doing most, they're prepared to uh, allow me to do that as, as a career. I'm so caught up in that, I don't have time to think, oh, Bach, this, this is where I really am. Finzi, this is, this is my composer, this is where my affinity. No, I'm just having a ball doing, doing all of it. Great, We're gonna, you're gonna share some with us this I afternoon. I am, I am, yeah. look forward to it. Uh, <clears throat> Beyond performing, you're also an accomplished composer. Uh, how does your experience as a uh, performer influence your compositional style? And what themes and ideas do you explore in your compositions? Oh, two great questions. Yeah. Hold the second one. Don't let me forget the second okay. part The second part to that. But, um, uh, and just remind me of the first part. Just, just give me the first, because I got, there, there are two questions there. What's the first part again? Oh, what was it? How do you experience, what it, how would, how do you experience as a performer? How's your influence? That's a great question. It, it, it's huge. Because I'm a performer and because I've sung a lot of contemporary music, um, I'm aware uh, that what is quite important to me is, is people. It's important to me that people enjoy music I write for them. Um, I am not afraid for them to be challenged by it, but I want... I want, generally speaking, for people to enjoy that challenge rather than think, oh, God, got to sing this piece by Roderick Williams again. Oh, it's so difficult. It's so, uh, it's so out of reach that there's n it's not even worth my trying to put in the effort in to try and reach it. It's really important to me that people feel connected to the music I write in some way so that they can feel that whatever effort they put in is going to be worthwhile. Mm. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, Many years ago, before the millennium, um, ex-Cathedra, Jeffrey Skidmore, uh, whose vocal group is called Ex-Cathedra, they commissioned me to uh, write a setting of the um, uh, O Antiphon, O Adonai, uh, for a particular service um, in a particular church in Birmingham. And I decided to use the upper gallery to put the sopranos up there, spaced apart, um, improvising off a central theme sung by a, a soloist and then everybody else was downstairs so um, it was a great idea and I, I really enjoyed myself and ha 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 how clever I turned up for the afternoon rehearsal on the day to, to see them all and see how they're all going and found the sopranos all huddled in a group ashen-faced terrified because they were being asked to improvise and that's from the past in the Baroque and Renaissance. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. it is. I'm yeah. just I'm I'm riffing off the sort of Saint Mark's Venice idea of having people spaced out in different yeah. areas. Um, because it was something they weren't used to doing, and also, of course, there was no recording of it. There's nothing there's no um uh, reference point for them. They were being asked to improvise, they didn't know quite what to do. They were way out of their comfort zone and they looked terrified. And I said to them, you know, when it says improvise, you can just sing a single note, you know, if you want to. If you don't feel confident, just sing a single note, help us keep in pitch. And so they nodded. Now, fast forward a few, it was a, it was a wonderful performance. Fast forward a few years, ex Cathedra, having recorded it, sing it as a party piece. They, they, they don't, it, it costs them, they, they, they sing it anywhere and, and have sung it anywhere and everywhere. This piece, actually, of all the pieces I've written, has gone out into the big wide world and it's sung all over the place because people know know now how it goes so the performers have lost their terror of the of its newness and now wear it like a like an old suit and feel very comfortable in the same way that some of the most some of the most terrifying pieces of music the Stravinsky's Rite of Spring or Schoenberg's Friede auf Erden for choir it's a really tough nut to crack until you've cracked it. And then it's an easy piece. Oh, that old thing. Oh, we sing it for, you know, we sing it as a warm up now. So um, what I mean to say by that is that uh, I am constantly writing music and giving it to people. And they say, oh, thank you, Roddy. That um, looks quite challenging. It's quite difficult. But it's only difficult 
when they don't know it. If they are able to invest time in it, then, and, and rather than try and sing it and sight read it and get it right first time, if they invest time and in hopefully will come out the other side and really enjoy it. I learned this from my performing uh, career, and it's really important, important to me that, that people enjoy it now. If, if when I'm dead and gone, my music dies with me, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm not writing for posterity. I'm writing for my friends. I'm writing for myself and my friends right now. And, and, and Todd, just remind me of the second part of the question because it was really... Oh, okay. What themes do you explore in your compositions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's interesting. Um, recently, I've been writing a lot about uh, love and death. Um, these are not... They, it, it, this is not... I'm not a composer who goes through life wrestling with the eternal questions necessarily. Um, um, I'm spend, I spend too much of my time in recital programs as a singer to have a thread as a composer saying the thing that, that my life's expression is going to be about is this one aspect of humanity. So I'm like a gadfly. I pick themes as I go. Someone asked me to write something for kids. I'm not going to write a Jungian analysis, analysis of the human psyche for them. I, I, I respond to commissions greatly. But a commission I was asked to do quite recently by the Bach Choir in London was for a piece to sit alongside the Dream of Gerontius, because you all know the Dream of Gerontius is far too short. <laughs> Needs another piece with it. Mm, not so short. Anyway, they asked me to write a piece and a companion piece for that. So I wrote a companion piece to a wonderful text um, uh, by a friend of mine called Romy Smith that considers the bit, the idea before and around Gerontius. Gerontius is about one, one man, one soul going into purgatory. And I was writing a piece about the people who are left behind, uh, the idea of grieving and, and how people process a death. And I wouldn't say move on, you never move on from a death, but, but, but a life continues to be lived. Um, and I realized that that, that, that idea of, uh, of uh, talking about people, about um, our experiences now, that's something th that interests me. So that if, if you imagine a lot of contemporary music uh, leaving human experience behind and going off into this cerebral kind of netherworld of mathematics and what have you, that's less interesting to me as a composer. What I'm interested in is, is moving people. Uh, and hopefully that's the thing. Well, next would be uh, kind of dear to your heart is uh, you've been involved in various educational and outreach projects, and such as your role as singer in residence for Music in the Round. Why is this work important to you, and how do you see it impacting the future of classical music? Well, I used to be a classroom music teacher. That was the career I thought I was destined for, and it's what I did in the first few years of, 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 of uh, my professional life. Yeah. Um, that... Um, I was about to say desire to teach. Uh, I'm not so, so sure I have a... Mm, I'm, uh, mm. I'll, I'll stick with it, though. That desire to teach, I think, remains strong in me. And the, it, it, it's, it's more about making a connection, a personal connection with an audience. Something, again, I hope to do later on today with the audience who come here is to make a personal connection with them. In one sense... It's part of sharing, but it's one sense it's it's teaching people about the music that I love and hopefully f allowing them to access it and enjoy it in the same way I do. So that's important to me. Also important to me is the idea that classical music as an art form is something I've taken taken not not for granted so much. It's something that's been a part of my life since. For, as I can remember, as I was discussing with you earlier. Um, and I look around, and particularly in the UK, but also in other places, the, the people are beginning to question whether it's got any relevance today anymore. And I find that confusing, and I find that a shame, because its relevance to me is <laughs> uh, continuous, continued. So I, I love the idea of sharing with younger generations, the, the idea that they can get something out of classical music in its loosest sense of classical, with the smallest C, classical music, they can get something out of that um, 
that I get out of it. All sorts of different things. It's hard to put into words what I get out of it. But I get something, and I, I love the idea that, that this should be available to anybody. Not everybody is going to enjoy classical music, period. You know, the way that, that I have some areas of music that I don't enjoy so much, that don't turn me on so much. But the idea is, is that, it, that it's accessible to everybody, that there should, there should be nobody who feels, oh, classical music, that's not for my kind of person, that's for this kind of person. And they look like this, they wear these sort of clothes, they drive these sort of cars. That's, a, that's maybe a peculiar English thing, but, but that's something I'm quite keen to dismantle, that idea. Great. Now, and you are bringing this up too, that in uh, 2017, uh, you're awarded the OBE. Oh, yes, yeah, gosh. Which is quite an honor uh, for your services to music. Being American, I didn't know a whole lot about that. But uh, before long, I don't know if you were a knight yet, but you will be a knight. <laughs> and how do you feel uh, about uh, recognition? And what does it mean to you in the context of your career? Well, in America, you're used to the idea of, of, of presidents awarding medals. Yes. Um, uh, Clearly, in the military sort of side of thing, you've got you've got to storm a bunker first, and you get you get a medal for bravery. Yeah. In the civilian field, um, maybe bunker storming is not quite so so apposite. But the idea that that you are being recognised for something you do by a, 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 not so much a higher body, but just by the by the country is yeah. is is just a beautiful thing. Uh, you go about your life, your profession. And, you know, you do that actually to earn a living, that's one thing. But when it gets to a point where you've you suddenly realised you've been noticed by people for the thing you do, that's just kind of beautiful. Um, it's especially beautiful for me in the, in the context of what I've, we've just been talking about, about where classical music sits in the realm of things. Um, we've just had an Olympics, for example, going through the Paralympics right now. And that's a national stage for athletes to show, I can run this fast, I can throw something this far. And we revel in it, we revel in the human, human achievement. Um, and the classical musicians, musicians in general, but classical musicians uh, are also able to do uh, extraordinary things, we hope, and move people in extraordinary ways. Um, and sometimes it's just the audiences in the concert hall who get to have that experience and go away if we're lucky, in wonder, wow. and to have the have the King of England, or the, the like, like it's a, the King of England representing the English establishment, going, this person's been doing something. Let's all just take a look. Let's put focus our lights on this person and show show that this person within classical music is important to us. That's uh, that, that was great for me. It's a lovely honour. It's not something I I. I, I don't have embossed cards with OB, OBE, you know. It's, it's, it's just lovely to note that was a thing, and also to note that the that King Charles is interested in classical music. Uh, that's really useful. Really, is a game changer for us in the classical music um, profession. To know that that he's really interested. He was a singer in the Bach choir that I mentioned earlier on. Yeah. He's a he played cello. He's a huge fan of the of British music, particularly the music of Hubert Parry, and and. It's just that, just that anybody's a fan of Hubert Parry. That's a win in my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, what advice would you give to young musicians who are starting their careers, especially those aspiring to become professional vocalists? That's a tricky one. Yeah. And the, in the context of my answer, I want to say that what I described to you is my life of stumbling around through teaching and then trying this music thing as a profession, as a, you know, I'll give it a go. Um, the picture I paint is of, of a young man, Roderick Williams, without an idea in his head about the music profession or what can be achieved and where to achieve it. Hadn't, hadn't a clue. I look at some of the young singers that come my way now, particularly through music conservatoires, but uh, lots of other walks of life. They are focused. They're, they're, a lot of them are really focused and they contact me Sometimes out of the blue and say, Mr. Williams, can I work with you on this repertoire, that repertoire? And they've, they've, they've found me and they realize that, that they, can, they might be able to get something from me that takes them to, the, to, an, to an, another level. Um, this focus is something I learn from. I learn from them. And I, I have huge respect for people who are, who are that knowledgeable, who've done their homework um, so I've turned your question on its head. This is what, this is, this is what 
they can give to me an idea of what discipline and focus means. However, in and amongst all of that, it does give me cause to, uh, 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 now as I approach my uh, 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 60s, to, to consider what it means to be professional. So we talk about you know, being a professional singer. Oh, I'm a professional singer. But I like to consider what being professional is. And inspired by some of the people I've met, I come into my, it comes into mind uh, how you can um, be ready for, for um, those opportunities that come that can be career changing. And the advice I would give to young singers now is, is to consider what it means to be disciplined and professional. So that those people, you, you take a class of singers, one class in one conservatoire, one year's worth, you've got maybe about 20 or 30 young, hopeful young singers in a room. And I look at them and you do the, the maths. Out of those 20 or 30 singers, maybe two or three are going to have a huge solo professional careers. Maybe three or four are going to have careers in other parts of the industry, maybe five or six might be in arts admin, and the others? And, and, and what separates them? Often it's not their talent, not necessarily their talent. Often it is their application, their dedication, their, their discipline that, that means that when an, uh, an opportunity, a big break comes their way, that they know how to seize it and they know what to do with it. It's a mindset often. So. I haven't given you a, a, a pithy one-liner, this is my advice, but, but it's a general area of, 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 of working out what it means to be professional. Great, great. Well, I've really enjoyed the interview with you today. It's been very, very enlightening. Uh, you're, you're a great speaker, and I like your personality. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we, uh, we, we finish our podcast? Yeah. Well, obviously, I have to say hello, Mum. That's, that's, you know, that's, uh, she's on the other side of the world. Imagine yes, my parents uh, the other side of the world. And I, and I owe them a great deal, actually. Yeah. I, because one other thing I'll just throw into to, to my love letter to my parents is that they love classical music. They come to concerts whether I'm singing them or not. But also, they were not helicopter parents. They didn't pressure me or my brothers. They, uh, by design or by accident, they gave us just the right amount of support. They drove us from rehearsals to concerts as cool children. I was playing a cello, you know, in one of those old wooden coffin cases. Um, and they were taking me backwards and forwards. And I, of course, just accepted their lifts um, and took it entirely for granted. I didn't think what they were missing and leaving at home to come and schlep their way to my concerts, be there, support me and all that stuff. They never pushed. They never turned music into something that, that I found to be a drag or a bore. Um, and nor did, they, nor did they blow smoke up, smoke up any of my orifices to try and give me the idea that I was super special and that I must be maintained like an orchid. Mm. Um, they, they had just they continue to be um, great audience members, great listeners, and they, they love the music that I sing. Uh, my dad's a real Finzi fan. My mum uh, is a great opera fan. So they, they enjoy it, and that is the best support that, um, that they could give me, the best start that they could give me. So um, hello, mum. Hello, dad. Oh, well, thank you.